February 2nd, 2021 Hemp Show powered by CanTrade. My name is Mark Ristelli. I'm the CEO of CanTrade and the host of The Hemp Show. Next on The Hemp Show is Ben Gonzalez, the VP of Business Operations at Premier CBD Labs. Ben is an executive level event, marketing, team, and project manager. He, his decade as a motion picture producer, event mar marketer for Fortune 500 clients, commercial real estate researcher, policy analyst, photographer, producer, content creator, and certified mediator make him a dedicated and effective leader, a fierce business strategist, an expert communicator, and passionate generator of invaluable business connections. Whoa, Ben, that was, that was a long sentence there. Ben utilizes his position to analyze hemp regulations and laws in order to better advocate for positive growth and change in the industry. Lastly, as an avid music lover, Ben moonlights as a Chicago Deep House DJ. Thank you very much for being here today, Ben. You've got the beats, so let's get this party started. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say that I wrote that myself, but most of it, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, I mean, from, from just reading that you've done it, you've done it all. And your fact that you're a, you're a deep house DJ or in Chicago is great. That uh, is it's awesome. A lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I got, I got to say that this town runs on house and blues uh, and, and a lot of stuff in between, but um and I'm working on some projects right now that are incorporating some Chicago house music into uh, some scenes outside of Chicago. That is really great. Um, but I'm not here to talk about house music. I, I could do that. I could do that for 15 minutes if you prefer. Hey, uh, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a different, that's a different, uh, that's a different channel. It's a different party right channel on. we're going to have. <laughs> right on. Um, and uh, to kind of go back on, on what our last presenter said, uh, you know, I can attest lime will kill some bitterness. It's, it's a great additive. And as uh, somebody who's of Mexican descent, there's a lot of lime in, in the foods that we make. Uh, and it, it can CBD tacos. Oh, that sounds bomb. Hey, right? I learn new things every day. I didn't know, I didn't know about the lime trick. Yeah, T-I-L. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I work with Premium CBD Labs. We're a third-party testing lab that is based in Madison, Wisconsin. We, we service the whole country. Um, and I'm not here to tell you about our lab testing services or why you should test your stuff or any of that. Um, I can touch on that later if there are questions about it. But uh, you had somebody on from a great lab last week, and uh, there, there's not much I can add to, to what she said. Um, today, I really wanted to help people understand what's going on with the final rules for hemp that just came out from the USDA on the eve of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, they, very, dropped it, they dropped it that day. Yep, they, very, very important too because the the industry as a whole has been has been watching this and just waiting to see what what the final rule lands on. Yeah, and you know, interestingly enough, when they when they came up with the interim rules in October they opened it up to comments from the industry and comments they got uh, when they published the final rules, they published pages and pages. I mean, this is a 96 page document, 40 pages of that probably are just them listing off comments that they got and responding to them, which I was really surprised about. And surprised which, which to see great. That, a lot of the yeah. times you're, a lot of times your comments kind of just enter the ether and, and that's it. You never know what happened to them. Right. Right. I mean, they, they singled out a lot of different perspectives and comments on this, but let, let's get down to some of the nitty gritty on this. One of the big Please. things that people had a misconception about with the interim rules and what the USDA's jurisdiction is and what their scope is, the, the, the 0.3% THC threshold that everybody is, is peeved off about, the USDA can't touch it. Uh, the USDA does not have jurisdiction to change the threshold of what it, what the definition of hemp actually is. That goes back to the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1946, as well as the amendments that have come forward from the 2014 Farm Bill and the 2018 Farm Bill. It's also outlined in the Controlled Substances Act. So if you want to bark on some doors about 0.3%, call your congressmen, call your senators, and uh, don't be shy. Write a letter to the DEA. Tell them to take it off Schedule 1, because Cannabis is, or THC is still schedule one, whereas fentanyl, which is killing people is schedule two. Right. Which we can all agree is absurd. Absolutely. Um, now, now quick, quick question before we jump off the, uh, the, the 0.03%. Um, now my understanding is part of the uproar was late related to them trying to classify THCA as, yep. as 
So basically the combination of THCA and THC has to be below your 0.03%. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. So they clarified that and they said, look, uh, we're regulating THC as the psychoactive compound, what we're going to say and what the laws, and again, this is codified in law, not just the USDA. The USDA is just kind of clarifying the position that if THC, Delta 9 THC specifically, is the psychoactive compound, then we have to test the hemp as if that THCA has been decarboxylated. So when you're getting your official compliance tests, and if you're working with a lab that knows their muster, they're going to report your THCA to you if they're using a HPLC. If they're using a GC, they probably can't, um, not with any certainty. But uh, they're going to report to you your total THC as well, either by decarboxylating the sample first by using heat, which is the most common method, or by accounting for the delta-9 THC and then adding your THCA in times 87%, so 0.8777, something like that. That's the conversion rate. Uh, but yes, they are saying total THC is what they're looking for. Okay, and then just to, I, I'm definitely not an expert here, but my understanding decarboxylation, when you, when you heat THCA, you have that, was it the carboxyl carbon attached molecule or something that then detaches to create THC, which surprisingly, even though that little tiny attachment at the end of the molecule, that creates a completely different effect, whether it basically takes the THCA from possibly non-psychoactive to psychoactive so that it can be used within the body and ingested and, and for recipes and ingredients. So right. I probably, probably butchered that a little bit, but uh, that was just to summarize there. Close enough. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that summarizes it very well. So when you heat it up, you're taking some carbon off and it changes the, the, the way that the, the compound acts. Um, similar things happen with other psychoactive substances. Then I can get into that in a different conversation sometime, but uh, it's very interesting. Um, they also clarified some other things, but anyway, so the USDA can't change that. Uh, it's, it's kind of a big sticking point. I kind of wanted to make that clear because the rest of this kind of falls in line after you understand that they can't change the 0.3% rule. What they can do is different. They also clarified that they're not regulating Delta-8. Delta-8 has been hot lately. It's been a big issue for a lot of people. There's been a lot of back and forth legally about it. Delta-8 is not regulated by the USDA. They said they, they specifically said it's because it occurs in such low quantities in the plant that they're not going to touch it. The DEA does have it listed as a Schedule One substance, though. So okay. Just that out there. I'm not going to say whether it's legal or not because I don't. I'm not a lawyer. Sure, so I'm sure. Not tell you. Yeah, we'll, that, we'll and I'm not we'll a try judge, to get a so we'll get a we'll get a host of lawyers on the uh, on on this next time to kind of give us some some opinions. <laughs> yeah, right. we we don't so, need to go that direction. Just to consult uh, your another attorneys. big. Yeah, exactly. Please consult your attorneys. Consult uh, consult the law books. Um, the other big one that's that's a huge issue is that the USDA is not going to be regulating work in progress hemp extracts or WIPHE. These are the intermediary compounds that come from when you start off, uh, you know, processing the hemp into crude or whatever, and it goes to other people. Um, then the they don't regulate that. Uh, the USDA's jurisdiction really stops with the plant. Uh, they they clarify, hey, we're 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 covering what's growing in the ground, not the processing of it. Processing is covered by the DEA and FDA respectively. Um, so that's another thing. Okay. Uh, so question, question on that one, would that be an overall, yeah. would that be an overall good thing or bad thing for, for the industry as a whole, or just kind of benign? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the, it's probably more, more gray benign. area. Yeah. It's more gray area. If, WIPHEs are regulated the same way as the DEA rules suggested. It could be bad with uh, just because they're, they're stating that anything that has above 0.3% THC is considered marijuana. So unless you have a DEA handling license, uh, you know, controlled substances handling license, you, you can't be touching this stuff. So for somebody who's making CBD gummies and they get their hands on some crude uh, or they're turning that crude into CBD isolate or whatever. That crude is technically a controlled substance. Um, now the mm -hmm. DEA hasn't really enforced this, but they could. I don't see that happening with the new administration and with the change in the DOJ, which heads up the DEA. Um, I think the, that the new administration is gonna have much more lax and lenient response to the, the cannabis industry in general, if not 
some of the promises that have been made from the on the, on the campaign trail for that. But 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 overall overall I'm I mean ultimately end goal here declassification can kind of fix all of that right I mean it could. Take, take away that take away that gray area and and then um, you know make it to where <laughs> obviously we don't need to have a class one classification for any of the cannabinoids really right. Right. So to go along with that, when they're measuring that total THC, and this is like, I've got a lot to cover here and I only have what, four minutes? Oh yeah. Apologize. Keep, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Keep off. Dive in. We, we're we're going to get on the long format for sure. Cause there, there's, there's a there's, lot here. There's so much to cover. Let me see if I can just run down the real quick list. Total THC when they measure it is done by dry weight. This means accounting for taking the moisture out of the plant. That's a big one. So you need to make sure. And again, we're talking about decarboxylated stuff. Uh, they changed the sampling requirements so that the top five to eight inches of the plant need to be collected. And the biggest thing about sampling requirements is that uh, they need to have 95% confidence that no more than 1% of that lot is going to exceed that 0.3% threshold. They're giving the states and tribes who adopt their own plans a little bit of leeway, and they're, they're able to adopt what is called a performance-based plan. And I probably should explain that a little bit in a different way at another time, but there's other stuff to cover that's probably even more important. One of them, and this is big, they're allowing for remediation. Oh, that is big. Very right, big. Yeah. right. So if you grow hot hemp and it's below the negligent threshold, which changed from 0.5% to 1%, another big one. So if you grow hot hemp and it's below 1%, it's considered good faith. You're not hit with a negligence charge um, and you, could, you have a chance to remediate it. You can do that a couple different ways. It's not great, but it's an avenue and it's a big, right. it's a big avenue. That other big thing to touch on that negligence thing. Again, if you grow below 1%, it is not considered negligence. However, if you grow above 1%, it is considered negligence. And you can only, this is big. You can only get one negligence charge per year now. Oh, so, so you can only wait. So you, sorry, let me rephrase that above 1% is negligence. Okay. Yes. So, so below 1%, you can remediate as much as you want. Right. Okay. If it's, <laughs> So still, if it's above 0.3%, it still needs to be destroyed. They're also right. allowing for on-farm destruction methods, and you don't need to have an agent there to witness it. You can okay. record it yourself and send in documentation. Um, you can mulch it back in. You can till it. You can, you can disc it. You can do a whole bunch of stuff on your farm to nullify it. You can take the flower off of the stem and sell the stem. Lots of different things. And I, I go into a bit more detail on this, and I'll be publishing something on our website later today, probably. Uh, not for we'll, sure, but we'll be uh, sure to, we'll be sure to, when you publish that, let us know, we'll be sure to send that out to, to the, uh, attendees and then also to the, to the network. Yeah. And that's uh, for sure. Um, so remediation is a thing and it, and it's, it is, it is possible. The big thing is you can't get more than one negligence charge in one year. However, if you get three negligence charges within the span of five years, you'll get your license suspended. Uh, they changed the sampling window. So you have now, instead of 15 days from the point of sampling to harvest, you have 30 days. No sampling post-harvest unless it's for remediated crop. Um, and there's other alternatives and stuff like that. But I, I want and, and there's other stuff that, that can go that I can get into on this uh, as far as the way that testing labs need to be registered. All the testing labs need to be DEA registered by the end of 2022, I think. Uh, they don't have to be ISO 17025 accredited, although it's recommended. Um, they haven't changed their felony conviction issue, which is if you have a felony conviction of a controlled substance, uh, you can't be in a hemp program for up to 10 years or after the period of 10 years after your conviction. Um, I think that that law is incredibly problematic because somebody mm -hmm. who's been convicted of manslaughter can go ahead and get a hemp license, whereas somebody who sold a bag of weed can't. Yeah, ridiculous. Um, right. But there, there's other stuff that relates to the tribal authorities, which is really big for the tribes, but I'm almost out of time and I yeah, I well, sorry, get out of the uh, sorry, sure. sorry about that, Ben. We need, we definitely need more time. One, one hundred percent. We're gonna get in a long format, sit down for a good, good hour, two hours, where we can just dive in, hash out, you know, everything that you've got got to say about this. And then also, I've just got a ton of questions because I'm not an expert on the on the regulatory body and and then you know the final hemp rule. Uh, yeah, and I see one at, somebody asking about any further details on Delta Nine or Delta Ten. Delta Ten isn't even mentioned in the hemp rules. Delta Nine is very specifically mentioned in the hemp rules. And again, as we go back, the USDA is concerned for official compliance purposes. Uh, Excellent. So, all right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and shift gears. 
So if you're interested in connecting with Ben and, and Premium CBD Labs, please add them to your network on CanTrade. You can also connect with them directly and ask questions from the Premier, from the Premium CBD Labs wholesale store, posted in the webinar chat, also in the CanTrade feed and in the podcast and YouTube show notes. Thank you so much for being here, Ben. We just scratched the surface and we've got to do it again. Definitely, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome.